Oh, James snuck up there. Oh, I was praying. I was going to give him a minute, but I don't have to now. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to look at two parables. They're very short parables. Um, that's why we, we, we picked two of them. Uh, Matthew chapter 13. We're going to start reading in verse 31 um, here in a moment. But just a, as a kind of just to remind ourselves, we've been studying the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God. We've, we've. Uh, I, I, I know there are, there are some that believe they're different, uh, but I believe Scripture is very clear, and that uh, in, in when you compare uh, the same conversations and the same teachings of Jesus in one in Matthew he'll say kingdom of heaven and the other in, in Mark and Luke and John he'll say kingdom, they'll say kingdom of God so I believe it's just the way it was recorded uh, but uh, uh, but so I believe they're the same we know that it's the the kingdom of God is not his earthly kingdom here uh, but it's a spiritual kingdom. Uh, Jesus began, and John the Baptist began to preach that the kingdom of heaven was at hand, and the kingdom of God was at hand, and Jesus began to preach the same thing. And in fact, he told his disciples to preach it. I believe the kingdom of heaven t- t- take, uh, came about uh, with the, uh, the, the sacrifice of Christ on the cross, and, and when people began to become spiritually alive, which they were not before. Uh, what a blessing to know that we can be spirit, we, that we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us and living within us, and and, and now we can be a part of uh, this kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven. We looked at uh, the, some parables of the kingdom of heaven. We've looked at uh, the parable of the four soils and how uh, there are four soils and five if you in, include the wayside. Uh, but uh, you got the parable of the four, four soils, but only one bore, bore fruit. And while the gospel is to, supposed to be shared to all, uh, not all will grow. Uh, not all will bear fruit. And, and it's, I, don't, I don't believe that, that we can call ourselves a Christian if we don't bear fruit. Uh, I, I believe the scripture is very clear in that. And so, so we looked at the four, four soils, the, the, the wayside, the, the, the stony soil, the... the uh, the uh, thorny soil and the good soil, and again, it was only the good soil which which bore fruit, and it bore multiple amounts of fruit. Um, so we, we see the gospel will have that effect on a heart, but it, it has to be a heart that is completely yielded over to the word of God. Um, we know that Satan's job is to try to blind the hearts of uh, of all those. He's mentioned in the, the those in the wayside as he steals the the seed from the wayside even before it's begun to. To, to plant itself into the soil. So, uh, his, again, his job is to blind the hearts of the lost. He does not want them to be saved. Last week we talked about the, uh, pe- the, the, to- the, the toil, the parable of the wheat and the tares. There we go. And uh, how uh, the sower planted the wheat, and uh, that was, the, that was, the, that was the, uh, the Son of God that planted the wheat, but Satan came along and planted tares. And it, how even amongst the kingdom of God, those amongst our churches, uh, there are tares, false, false fruit. Um, and, and we can't tell the difference. We can't, I can't look in somebody's heart and say whether or not they're saved. It's the Holy Spirit's job to look into somebody's heart and convict of sin, of a lack of righteousness, and to convince of the judgment to come. That's what Jesus said the Holy Spirit's job was. Uh, we looked at that at, uh, in, our, uh, in our New Converse class today. Uh, the job of the Holy Spirit in the heart of the lost is con- to con- convict of sin. It does not say the pastor's job is to convict of sin. The pastor's job is to preach the truth, to preach the gospel. It's the Holy Spirit's job to do the rest. That's why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit, because it doesn't do any good. I can say all the right things, and the, the, nobody will listen, and, and it won't make a difference if I don't say it in the power of the Holy Spirit. So, and then we also looked at the end of that parable where there will be a separation, a time of, a time of judgment when uh, it's not for the, the, the workers to go out, so it's not for us to go and pull up the, the tares because we may accidentally pull up some wheat uh, in the process. Uh, it is going to come at the, in the last days uh, that, that God's going to separate out and remove the tares from the wheat. The tares will be burnt up, the Bible said, and uh, Jesus said at the end of the parable, uh, that uh, then shall the righteous, verse 43 of Matthew 13, then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their Father, who hath ears to hear, let him hear. Today we're going to look at two parables. The first parable is this, found in verse 31. This is another parable, put he forth unto them. Now remember, he's speaking to the disciples, uh, but there's a, a great multitude there. And he's speaking in parables for the purpose that not everybody is to understand this truth. 
That's why he says, he that hath an ear to hear, let him hear. He says, he says he, saying, the kingdom of heaven is like to a grain of mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field, which indeed is the least of all seeds. But when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh a tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. Now, how many of you have seen a mustard seed? Many, many of us have. I, I, I do want you to know one thing. It is not the smallest seed out there. Um, you can find smaller seeds. But back in Jesus' day, it was commonly used when you're talking about something small, like when he's talking about small faith. Or small, when, you're, when you're trying to compare something small to saying it's really, really small, they would say it's like a mustard seed. So Jesus wasn't saying that, that, that the mustard seed is the smallest of seeds. Uh, he was just using the normal comparison that they used back in those days. But, but with that, we need to understand when he says the kingdom of heaven is like that little mustard seed. And when it's, when it's planted, and we're going to talk about what, what this means, when, it, when it's planted and it grows, man, there is a huge amount of growth and, the, and a fast amount of growth. Man, those, the mustard herb grows quickly and it does grow into a tree. It does say it's the greatest of, of all the herbs. And well, what does that mean? Why is that important? Well, he's talking about the kingdom of heaven. Right and the, uh, right at that point in time, uh, the kingdom of heaven. At, at the end of uh, after Jesus, do you remember John chapter? I believe it's John chapter twenty-one. I gotta look it up real quick because it wasn't part of my notes. It's after Christ resurrects. He breathes upon the disciples. It says he breathed on them, and he says, "Receive ye." The Holy Ghost. John chapter 20. Turn over there real, real quickly with, with me if you would. Now the Holy Spirit has not come down. Uh, uh, it, the Comforter has not come uh, as, as far as the Pentecost. They're waiting for that. But in John chapter 20 we see, we see this. John chapter 20 verse 22. It says this. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. He's given, he has given them the Holy Ghost. Just prior to this, uh, he's, he, is, uh, uh, he has been uh, resurrected. Uh, uh, he's now uh, come back. He's in his glorified body. And he's, he's given them the Holy, Bo Holy Ghost. What has happened? What's transpired? Trans what has transpired from the death of Christ and the resurrection of Christ? What's different about previous to his death? They were saved looking. They were saved by faith. All believers were saved by faith. Previously, looking ahead to the death of Christ, when Christ died, what happened in that in the, the holiest of holies? The veil was ripped. Why? Because his blood had been placed on that, and that on that altar up in heaven, and never had to be dealt with anymore. So these men were now saved by their faith in Jesus Christ. Judas is not not among them anymore. When he breathed on those men, he was breathing on the eleven that were left. He breathed on them. He says, "Receive ye the Holy Ghost." Uh, uh, it's important to understand. So they have the Holy Ghost uh, uh, upon them. It, 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 the, the Comforter hasn't come to to all yet. It would, but right here is just the twelve. But something something had changed. And when God started with the kingdom of heaven, it started with that 11. There wasn't, uh, when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about all those who would by faith trust in Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, in us, the Holy Spirit it dwells all of us. Without, without the Holy Spirit, what does the Bible say? We are none of his. We're not his. They have the Holy Spirit. The, uh, and remember, it's a spiritual kingdom. Right? So they're, they're spiritually alive. And uh, look over with me to Isaiah Chapter, sorry, Matthew chapter 10. I want you to see the progression of this group or, or how quickly the kingdom of heaven grows because that's what, that's what we're talking about. That's what this, 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 uh, this parable is talking about. It's how, how quickly and how powerfully uh, the kingdom of heaven grows. Matthew chapter 10, look at verses 2 and 4. Now the names of the twelve apostles are these, the first Simon, who is called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, and James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, Philip, and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the publican, James, the son of Alphaeus, and 
Labaius, whose surname was Thaddeus, I'm glad he had a surname, Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them. So here you, you have the twelve uh, that, rece- that uh, minus Judas will, will be there at the end when Christ is resurrected. Uh, Judas, I don't believe, was ever saved. If he was saved, I believe that he would have, well, Satan couldn't have come into him. They were followers of Christ, but remember, the blood, the blood hadn't been placed. He, he, Judas never fit in with the rest while he looked the part, while he acted the part. The Bible refers to him as a thief. And even here in Matthew 10, the one who would betray. Right? Uh, I don't believe Judas was ever saved, because if he was saved, he could, have lost, he could lose his salvation. Judas was just a follower of Jesus Christ. Even today, there are followers, people that will follow and come to church that are not saved. They've never placed their faith in Jesus Christ. This is the beginning of uh, the kingdom of God. The, they, they didn't all stay in one place. and be, They weren't all the church, but it, the church hasn't come yet. So, so you have here the ten, and, or the eleven, and what happens? After, after eleven in Matthew chapter, or sorry, Luke chapter ten, what do we see? It goes, goes from the eleven, or twelve, I guess. Luke chapter ten, it goes to 70. Followers of Christ. Verse 1 says, After these things the Lord appointed others 70 also, and sent them two and two before his face into every city and place whither he himself would come. Go on to Acts chapter 1, verse 13. So it went from... 11 or 12 to, to 70. In Acts chapter 1, verses 13 through 15, we have a different number. What's happening? The number of the kingdom of heaven is growing. Acts chapter 1, verses 13 through 15. 13 says this, and when they were coming to the upper room, uh, where both Peter and James and John and Andrew and Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew and James, the son of Alphaeus and Simeon and Zelotus, and Judas, the brother of James, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. How many are there? There's about 120, the Bible tells us. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, adding to that 120, says that they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Acts chapter 5. Actually, Acts chapter 4, verse 4. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. So we went from, from 120, or from 12 to 70 to 120, to 3,120. Now we have 8,120, give or take. Acts chapter 5, verse 14. And, and, and believers were the more added to the Lord. Multitudes, both of men and women. We can't even, it doesn't even give a number anymore. It's just saying multitudes. And halfway through the book of Acts, in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, we know much has taken place, and there are years that have passed here. But in Acts chapter 17, verse 6, uh, the, the Christians here, uh, Paul is, is, uh, is preaching on this day, and, and uh, this is verse 5, But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, who was one of the Christians, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, crying, These these that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. So it started as just a small group of followers of Jesus Christ who, who taught them, who led them, who man, they, 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 they saw miracles performed, but more than the miracles, he had, according to Peter, the words of life. 
Remember he says, when, when he began to preach a hard message and everybody left, he said, hey, are you going to go also? And they said, where are we going to go? You have the words of life. And they, they, they followed him. And yes, they, they had their struggles and Peter ran. And in fact, they all ran when, when he was arrested. Uh, but, but, but they saw him, the resurrection. They, 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 Jesus, Jesus asked Peter, do you love me? And his answer was yes. Do you love it? He asked them three times. Remember this. It, it, it was during this period of time that, that and they, they, not only did they know and believe, now they understood what this was all about. That he wasn't going to have some earthly kingdom. That this spiritual kingdom is what they were looking for. And, and so, so he tells them, listen, go into Jerusalem and I want you to stay there until the power of God, the spirit of God comes down, the, the comfort that was promised them. And so they, they do that in the, in the beginning of the book of Acts. And they begin to pray and seek God that that comfort would come and that spirit would come and that the power of God would move and man does God work because in Acts chapter 2 uh, Peter begins to preach and the gospel is heard by, by all these people that are at the, that are at the temple and man and the spirit of God does come and convict them of their sin and convict them of their lack of righteousness and, con and show them that judgment is coming it wasn't the words of Peter I can go up anywhere and preach that same message word for word how he preached it because I have it in the book of Acts and nothing would happen people would mock and people would laugh and nobody would listen but that day the spirit of God moved in a way that he had never Ever done before, and 3,000 people accepted Jesus Christ in one day. Think, wow, that's amazing. It is amazing. And then shortly after that, one chapter later, 4,000 people get saved. Man, it's just getting better and better. And next it says, multitudes and upon multitudes. I don't know how many people were there in the church in Jerusalem, but they were not supposed to stay there. In fact, Acts chapter one verse eight told them that they would that they would be that the church would begin that they would be, they were to preach in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and the and the uttermost parts of the earth everywhere was to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. They were under the rule of Rome. Remember, and rule, Rome had its fingers everywhere. As far the, the, Rome was the known world. That doesn't mean there weren't other people, other other places. But Rome was the known world as, as far as most history was concerned. And what happened in Acts chapter seven? God used a man who wasn't even a preacher to preach one of the greatest messages that nobody but one person got saved. And we say, oh well, those other those other messages were more important. No, they weren't. Because Paul heard that message. And Paul was the one who was to go and to preach to the Gentiles. And when Paul, uh, Paul began to, shortly after that, whether because of his conviction, whether he was kicking against the pricks, as what Jesus, uh, because of the conviction in his heart, man, he began to persecute the church. And what's the chapter 8 say? Man, they all ran, except for the apostles. They stayed there in Jerusalem. And everybody else left, left Jerusalem, and they went everywhere. And it tells us in verse 2, they went everywhere preaching the gospel. They got, people got saved in Samaria. Philip went down to Samaria and preached there. Uh, then he went to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Ethiopian eunuch. They were just going everywhere preaching the gospel, and people were getting saved. Why? Because there's power in the gospel of Jesus Christ. We, 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 see, uh, we, we get in our mind, we look back in the book of Acts and think, well, that was amazing what God did there. God can still work. We limit the amount... Uh, we, We'll say, well, I know God can work. Maybe some. Do we understand the power of the Holy Spirit conviction on the hearts of those people? 3,000, 4,000 people believed. Multitudes upon multitudes in a day and age when it wasn't where easy to accept Christ. It wasn't easy to be a Christian. Here in America, it is easy. You say a prayer, you go to church, and, and you live your life, and everything's normal. The, uh, our, difficult, our biggest difficulty is our flesh. And fighting, amongst, uh, fighting with, uh, within ourselves individually as Christians. They lived in a day where they were being persecuted, their homes being ripped from them, and they were being chased down the street. And yet, even yet, the kingdom of God spread like wildfire. The kids at the team thing yesterday on the other team, uh, the, other, the other skit, the one that wasn't as funny and didn't win, it wasn't the one that our team did, uh, they, they did a skit about the coronavirus and how it's going to kill everybody. That was their skit. It was really kind of sad, depressing. <laughs> As, as, as contagious as the coronavirus might be, or any other virus out there. 
understand the power of God in the gospel so much greater. And, and that's what Jesus is trying to get the, the disciples to understand about that little mustard seed. Man, it looks small. You think this, this little 12, group, group of 12 people, they can't do anything. And, and, and that's absolutely true. They can't. But the kingdom of God isn't in the person. It's in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not in me. It's in God in me. And man, that, begin, that, that opens the doors to understand what's, what happened there because they went from just being a small group of people that were, uh, that were considered outcasts for a while to being the ones who were, they, they were blamed for turning the world upside down. Now why is that important for us to understand? Man, because it gives us hope that there is still power in the gospel. It'll give us drive. That, hey, listen, it doesn't have anything to do with me, but my God, my God could do much more than I ever could. One of the reasons I think that we don't see souls saved like we should is, one, we don't go. We don't go. Jesus said go. The seed doesn't get planted like it should. That's on us. God gave us the recipe on how to do it. Go. Tell them. Preach the gospel. It's not my job to convince somebody to become a Christian. Because if I can convince them to become a Christian, they're still not a Christian. They just have the head understanding of what we teach. It is my job to preach the gospel and in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where this is the big difference. We do so much in our own strength and in our own power that we don't see any fruit. We wonder why. Because the kingdom of heaven is spiritual not physical. I can sell you, I can sell you all kinds of products. I can go door to door and I can sell vacuum cleaners and be successful. I can go door to door and hand out tracts and get people to pray a prayer and say I'm successful and I've seen it and I've heard it in other churches. And I'm not I'm not knocking I'm not saying that knocking on doors and handing out tracts is bad. It's good. Done correctly. It's, it's, it's good done correctly, but it's got to be done in the power of the Spirit. Look, th- thinking back to the, the days, in, and, and I'm going to say that they were super, superhuman Christians. They were, they were Christians that they, I think of D.L. Moody and R.A. Torrey and Charles Spurgeon and all these men who, Jonathan Edwards, they spent more time in prayer than they did anything else. And honestly, that is where we're lacking. Because the same Holy Spirit that indwells me indwelt them. And the same power that's available to, that was available to them is available to me. But, just, but teens, it, it has to do with what we talked about down there. Are we plugged in? Are we plugged in? Are we allowing the Spirit of God to work through us and to fill us and so that we can be used by God for what he has purposed the church and every Christian to be used for? The Spirit of, the Spirit of God will work for you. It will work through you. It will work in you. But you have to let it. You have to seek it. Man, it, it comes in prayer. Remember, look over at Luke, Luke chapter 11. We're only part way. We may not get to the second uh, parable. We'll see. Luke chapter 11. Jesus is, is teaching the disciples. I think it's Luke chapter 11. Teaching the disciples how to pray. Is that it? Yes. So uh, Luke chapter 11, he's teaching the disciples how to pray. In, in verse, uh, verses 7 and 8, he gives them a parable and teaches that it's importunity. It's the, you keep asking, you keep asking, and, and, and because you keep asking, God will give it to you. Look down at verse 12. Or we'll start with verse 11. If a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father... Will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he for a fish give him a serpent? Or if he shall ask an egg, will he offer him a scorpion? Obviously, the answer is no. No good father here on this earth would give a hungry child something that could hurt them or kill them. Verse 13, If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, 
how much more shall, shall, not may, but shall, meaning he will do it, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? The, the, this parable and all this, this, this is the truth that, that Jesus was teaching the disciples. Don't stop asking for the power of the Holy Spirit. Why do you think they prayed for days and days and days in that upper room, waiting for the Holy Spirit? Because Jesus taught them to keep praying until they got it. We, we pray once before we go out on, uh, we'll, we'll go out and do visitation, and we'll spend five, maybe two minutes in prayer saying, Lord, help us to walk in your word and go where you want us to go and talk to the right people. And that's, all we, that's, that, that's our prayer time for, if that's our prayer time for visitation, it is no wonder nobody gets saved. It is no wonder. Why? Because God said, you ask. And many times after we do that once or twice or three times, we give up because, hey, nobody, it's never worked before. Guess what? Keep asking, because eventually, somewhere along the line, your Heavenly Father will bless you with the Holy Spirit, because His Word promises us that He will do it. He desires to give you the Spirit of God. Why? Because He desires you to fulfill the purpose, Molly, that He has for you. But he can't, you can't do His purpose without His Spirit. It's that, it's that way for all of us. So the kingdom of heaven has grown exponentially. We're not talking about multitudes. We're talking about millions across the, across the globe. The, man, people are saved all over. And the, the, the slowest that we're seeing it is here in the United States. Not just, not just New England or Maine or, or, or even in our town. The slowest is in the United States. You go over to the Philippines or you go over to, to Syria. You go over to China where it is hard to preach the gospel, where it is dangerous dangerous to preach the gospel, you'll find men and women who are filled with the Spirit of God because they are relying on that because they need it to preach. When the disciples came up against Prabhupada, what did they do? In Acts, in Acts chapter 4, they prayed for boldness. Not for freedom. We have the freedom. They didn't pray for the, 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 the threat of their safety to be removed. No, they said, give us boldness to preach regardless of what happens. And the Holy Spirit fell upon them and they preached the gospel and that's when people got saved. We need the Spirit of God. If, we're not, if we don't see a growth of the kingdom of heaven within our realm, of our, our sphere of, 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 of influence, that's on us. Not on God. Now there will come a time when it gets harder. And I believe we're kind of, part. we may be partly in that time. But part of that is of our own making, not, uh, not just the Christians, but of the nation. We are, uh, we are a wealthy nation. We, we don't have need of much. And men are lovers of their own selves. They don't want to hear bad things. They don't want to feel bad about themselves. Uh, I get that and I understand that. But, but listen, while it may be impossible for a rich man to get to heaven on his own, I can tell you it is possible with God. Nicodemus went to heaven. Joseph of Arimathea went to heaven. These were rich, wealthy men who had great power. Paul went to heaven. Don't tell me the gospel can't save them. Don't tell me the gospel can't save them. It can But we, in the power of the Spirit of God, need to do our part. Now, now notice the, this, next, this next part of, of this. Uh, go back to Matthew chapter 13. There are two parts to this. Two truths that I see here. And it, it really it kind of ties in. But Verse 32, Which indeed is the least of all seeds, but when it is grown, it is the greatest among herbs, and becometh the tree, so that the birds of the air come and lodge in the branches thereof. So this idea of, this, of the mustard tree, have you ever seen a mustard tree? It actually, they aren't actually that big. Oak trees are bigger. It's not the biggest tree. But, but this, the, the idea of Jesus saying that it's big enough for the birds to come and to, to make their home, it's not even a, a tree that birds would typically make their home in. Uh, but it's the picture of the, the idea that it's this great expanse of a kingdom. That this kingdom will, 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 will wrap around the entire globe, uh, spiritually speaking. And it will do that. But I don't believe it's just, uh, remember, the Jews think the kingdom of heaven is just for them. It's just for the Jews. Uh, uh, in fact, it isn't until the middle of Acts when Peter goes and finally is told by the Spirit of God to go preach to Cornelius. 
right? Uh, Paul uh, becomes the Gentile, or the apostle to the Gentiles. But, but before that, we already knew that the Gentiles were to be saved. Look over at Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. Matthew chapter 8, verse 11. We'll start verse 10. It says, When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I say unto you, that many shall come from the east and west, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. He's saying, listen, uh, uh, you have great faith. And he's talking to a Roman centurion. Uh, uh, man, and he's saying, and I, and I say this unto you, that they're going to come as far as the east is, as far away as the west, and they're all going to come in and be a part of the kingdom of heaven. This was news to Jews, to the Jews. This was news to the disciples, because they thought it was just for them. But, but good news for us, it's for us too. It's for everybody, from, from every nation, from every language. And I read the book of Revelation, it talks about this, this mass of people praising God and singing his praises and singing how he's worthy as they, in every tongue and every nation is presented there. Which gives me hope, because can I tell you this? Not every tongue in, in, the, nation, in the world, not every nation in the world has the gospel. And we talk about how, how listen, that souls can be, that, that Jesus can come back at any time. There are people that don't have a Bible. In fact, I believe a third of the world doesn't have a Bible. It's actually bigger, more than that. There's, how can they accept Christ? You know what that tells me? We've got our work cut out for us. God's not done yet. Romans chapter 11 says, Blindness in part has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. The last Gentile is saved. So that's not going to take place until the end times. There's still people to be saved. So do I think Jesus is going to come back? I don't know when he's going to come back. I'm not going to put any date on it or say it can't be. That's for God. All I know is that I'm supposed to do and what we're supposed to do. And that's to pray for the Spirit of God that we might go forth and spread the gospel to see a world that's lost be saved. Remember, what is, what is the purpose for, for, what is Christ's vision for Fellowship Baptist Church? It's on, it's on all of your bulletins. Do you have it? At least it used to be on the bulletin. It is. I don't know what I did with mine. Acts chapter... I don't have it. 20, I, I do it with something like that. Acts chapter 26, 18. That he might turn from them from darkness into light. There we go. Thank you. To open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, and from the power of Satan unto God, that, he, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them that are sanctified by faith that is in me. That's Christ's vision. Not just for our church, though we, that we've, I, we've, we've claimed it. It's for God's vision for every church. That's why we're here. But we need the Spirit of God. We need, yes, I know that we have the Spirit of God. We need the power of God. We need the filling of the Spirit of God to be able to do that. This time is it? The next one's so short. I promise it will only be a moment. We won't go. Matthew 13. And this it ties in, so I, I can't really skip it. Matthew 13, go back. The second parable is this. It's found in verse 33. And another parable spake he unto them, the kingdom of heaven is like an eleven, which a woman took and hid in three measures of meal till the whole was leavened. And that's the whole parable. He says the kingdom of heaven is like this. 
leaven hidden in a measure of meal till the whole is leavened. Now scripturally, we are to define words by the Bible. Matthew chapter 16. We, we know that leaven is yeast. Leaven is what was used to Leaven is used to uh, to help bread grow and open up, but we know scripturally, the Jews and God didn't look at leaven in a good way. Matthew sixteen verse six says this: Then Jesus saith, said unto them, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. And later, later is he. He helps them to understand that he's saying, beware of the, the false teaching of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Matthew chapter 7, verse 15. Actually, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. First Corinthians chapter 5, 6 through 8 says this, Your glorying is not good. Know ye not that a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, as ye are unleavened, for even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. The leaven here is considered sin. It says remove that leaven. Look over at Galatians chapter 5, 7 and 8. He says, you did run well. Who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? What's going on in Galatians is that while they started well in the gospel, somebody came along and, and tried to twist the gospel a little bit, began to preach some untruth, so much so that it began to affect the entire church. In fact, uh, uh, not just that church, but lots of churches. Paul dealt with it uh, many times. In fact, they, it became such a problem, they went back to Jerusalem to deal with the issue with the apostles in Jerusalem. Leaven is, is, isn't considered a good thing in Scripture. It's considered a bad thing in Scripture. Uh, so, so when it says the kingdom of heaven is, is like uh, a, a woman hiding uh, leaven in, in uh, three measures of meal uh, so that it, it changes, the leaveneth the whole amount. Listen, you don't put a lot of leaven in, in when you're making bread. It's just a, a tiny little amount. But that tiny little amount affects the entire bread. You let it sit for a while, it, 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 it swells and grows. I always liked that as a kid. You get to come in and punch it, and it deflates, and that was always cool. Uh, I remember doing that when I was a kid. But Israel, didn't, don't, they don't eat leavened bread, especially not on Sabbath. Uh, they, it was considered sinful. It was wicked. So, so, so what is this? I believe, I, I, I believe that this is false truth being entered into the kingdom of heaven. Somebody, somebody preaching or twisting the gospel of Jesus Christ, adding works to salvation, and it begins to affect, which it did in Galatians. They, they had to address it at the church of Galatia. They had to, in fact, the Bible tells us several, in several places that false teachers will be among you. And In fact, in, 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 in Paul's talking in Acts chapter 20 to the Ephesians, he says that, that the ravenous wolves would come and that some would even rise up from among them Listen, we need to be very careful of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because remember, when I, when I say this, that these two are tied together. The kingdom of, of heaven, uh, it will grow. But man, we can destroy what God can do by preaching a false gospel. And we can give people a false hope. And, and it may start here, and then go here, and here, to where, listen, it happened, what, why do you think there are so many denominations out there? God never said, thou shalt be called Baptist, and Baptist thou, for, thou forever shalt be. It's not, God didn't intend for it to be that way. Jesus said, I will build my church. He didn't say, I will build the Baptist church. 
The church, uh, there, there, were, there, were, there were difference and changes and, and difference in beliefs and difference in, uh, and, and began to morph into many different things. The, the Catholic church became, a, became big and the, they, began, they began to add a lot of things to the gospel of Jesus Christ and, and a lot of things to scripture. And in fact, to the point where they wouldn't even let people read scripture so they would know what the word of God said. And they said, we'll tell you what you're supposed to do. Bring us your money and we'll pray for your dead folks. And they did all kinds of terrible things. And, and in the, doing that, they persecuted the actual Christians, those that uh, refused to have their children baptized. And those, they, they did terrible things to them. And what, what, what happened? And it got into that leaven, and it just destroyed so many. Now, that doesn't mean somebody that's Catholic can't be saved. But if they believe everything the Catholic Church teaches, they follow after it, then they are denying the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we need to be careful that we preach the gospel. We started well. Let's run well with it. Let's rely on the Holy Spirit of God. Let's, let's seek God to give us what we need, the power of God and the power of the gospel. That is all we need. He gave us this book for a reason. To read it, to study it, to live it, and to preach it. Last passage, Second Timothy. Chapter 3. It's this this know also that in last days perilous times shall come. Men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despisers of those that are good, traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. And then he says, from such turn away. Know that we're I believe, at least in the United States, that we're in a time like that where we have uh, false teachers and people that are just all about themselves and pretending that they love God, but really they love themselves. They have a form of godliness. They look like they're Christians, but they deny the power of God. And I know this is speaking of false teachers. It goes on says, for of the sword are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women, laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Then Paul says in verse 10, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience. Verse 13, Evil men shall, and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But you, Timothy, continue thou in the things which thou hast learned. And the husband assured of knowing. Listen, we live in a day and age that re very much resembles the first half of that chapter. But you, Timothy, you, Donnie, you, Frank, Brother Troy, Rich, you continue in the things that we've been taught. The things of this word. And the very next chapter says this, verse 2. Well, verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his, at his appearing. Preach the word. Be instant, in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come that they will not endure it. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves, teachers having itching ears. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. All we can do is preach the word. All we can do is keep being faithful. Whether or not, we're, whether or not we see great results or not, I do believe that if we would spend more time in prayer, more time seeking the power of the Holy Spirit, that we would see more fruit. And I'm not just trying because I want notches on our belts or to make a bigger church. I want to see the kingdom of heaven grow 
I want to see so I want to see I want to see uh, next next year at the team at the, or maybe the summer at the team thing having it wouldn't be awesome Molly if we had 15 or 20 people with us that we have a that'd be great and they'd all be and they'd be saved but that takes time and it takes prayer and it takes sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ wouldn't it be awesome brother rich if 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 you were able to to come in and we and you'd have two or three co-workers that man because because of prayer and a constant faithful witness they they they've come to Christ what a blessing that and, and I'm not just picking on certain people it, it it goes for all of us if we all just brought in one next year there'd be 60 of us here I don't know how many there are. I'm counting the kids too. But they can bring in one too. Because while we may limit by age and by God does not. And the power of God can touch one of the heart that young a whole lot faster than my than somebody is hardened because they're older. Let's let's get busy on making foolproof of the ministry God's given to us. Father God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for your word. Lord, just the truth we have here in thinking about the kingdom of heaven. Lord, what a blessing to know it isn't dependent upon us. It's dependent upon us depending on you. And God, I pray that you'd help us to do that. Lord, that we'd put ourselves to the side and truly seek your face and your help as we go forward. To walk to the walk the walk of faith, to preach the truth, and to love others like you loved us. God, I ask that you would bless each one of us. Lord, thank you for those who are here. Lord, may we glorify you and bring honor and glory to your name as we go forth. And Lord, may we hear and see someone get saved this week because we're faithful to what you've called us to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.